Hey guys, thanks for checking out the My Career Path podcast. So today I'm gonna to be going over a book review, which is something that I do frequently on this channel, just going over the various books that have been recommended to me by my guests, sharing with you guys my favorite quotes, my favorite takeaways, and what you guys can apply in your own career path. So let's get into it. All right, so let's jump into it. This book is Leadership and Self-Deception uh, by the Arbinger Institute. I keep wanting to say Arbinger Institute, but it's Arbinger Institute. And this is Leadership and Self-Deception, Getting Out of the Box. And so this is a book that was recommended to me by my dad when I was talking with him about my current career. I think this was a couple years ago. And I was just talking about different jobs and going... <sighs> I'm just having a hard time, Dad. I I'm having a hard time with my coworkers, with my bosses. It just doesn't seem to be working. And honestly, I blamed a lot of it on them. It wasn't a problem with me. It was a problem with my coworkers and my bosses and whatnot. So as I was expressing my frustrations, my dad said, hey, you should probably check out this book. Read through it. They wrote it in more of a novel kind of style. So instead of just kind of listing facts and whatnot reading at you, they actually make a story about it. And so the story is about a, a newly hired manager at the Zagram company is what it is. And so he's invited to meet with the vice president to learn about this system that they've been using that's really transformed the company. So it's a self-help book that kind of goes over how you see other people and their faults, as well as how we see ourselves. A lot of the times we end up seeing the world as justifying our behavior. We see everything around us as justifying the way that we're acting. And we need to kind of get out of that box of self-deception to actually enjoy being with other people. So one of the first things that the book actually talks about is the box. And right here on the front cover, it says getting out of the box. And it's actually kind of funny because the book actually makes a joke about how after he learns about the box and the self-deception and whatnot, he tries to tell his wife and his family, and he's like, it just doesn't work. So I'm going to do my best. I highly recommend you guys pick up that book. Hopefully read it for yourself, and you guys can understand a lot more than I do. Something that's taught early on is that when we are in the box, instead of seeing people as people, we tend to see them as objects. And so a lot of the times when we get frustrated with our coworkers, we just see them as, well, they have to be here to fulfill their tasks. You know, we have to check off the boxes to make sure everything's taken care of for the business instead of seeing them as they really are, which is people. Leadership and self-deception actually goes over several examples about how we may see people in the box. One of the first ones that goes over is the main manager, Tom, who's the one meeting with the vice president. He hasn't quite learned all the names of the people in his department. He's worked there for probably, I think, three months, right around two to three months. So, you know, a good period of time. You could probably learn some people's names in that time. But Bud, who's the vice president, says, hey, this is so important that if you don't take the time to actually learn people's names, you're probably seeing them more as objects rather than as people. And so I've only ever really worked with small businesses and small companies. You know, we've had a tight group of five to 10 people. So it's never really been a problem. However, there was a time when I was working at GE Healthcare and we had a big shipping department and I really only knew the people on my shift. I didn't know the second shift. I didn't really know the swing shift. I, I interacted with the second shift more than the swing shift, but do I remember any of their names? No. Did I take the time to actually talk with them, to meet with them, to, to know who they are? No. And so that was something that I saw in myself immediately going, okay, how am I seeing other people? Am I really taking the time to actually learn their names, learn who they are, what they care about? Or am I just kind of saying, nah, this is just a means to an end. And it applies to my current job too. When I have customers come in, I try to learn their names. And the hard part is remembering their names because when they come back, it's on me to kind of remember the name. It doesn't matter if they remember my name or not. I, I don't really care about that, but I strive to learn people's names and figure out who they are. So another thing that Tom kind of breaks into when he's talking with the vice president is that he's actually been having trouble in his personal life as well as his business life. I think it's kind of funny because in a lot of these books, there's when they write it like this, because I remember reading The Goal, and when I was reading The Goal, they did a similar thing, you know, hey, not only is he struggling in his professional career, he's also struggling at home and kind of how those two always go hand in hand. Something, something that I think is a little funny when they write more of these narrative self-help books. So something that is frequently... So the importance of seeing people as people instead of objects. And I think this is especially portrayed in our media because a lot of the times they're going to paint the picture of the opposition, whoever opposes us, disagrees with us as dehumanizing them. They want to try to paint them as less human than we are because that way we're more likely to go with them. 
We're more likely to agree with our side and kind of get behind the changes and, and policies that are coming into place. So taking that human spirit out of it so that way instead of seeing them as people, you see them merely as opposition, merely as objects helps them to kind of drive you to a certain goal or reach a certain conclusion. And so when you start to do these things and see people more as just objects, you start to do things that you may not normally do because you actually end up feeling justified in your action because they're in the wrong. It's not that they're wrong people. It's that they are wrong. And so Bud also provides another example of how he got into the box in relation to his wife. So Bud, being the vice president and kind of teaching about this box and about self-deception, provides this example. And I thought it was really important to understanding what self-deception is and how it applies to us. So one of the first things that he talks about is he and his wife are laying in bed. You know, it's late at night. They're getting ready to go to bed, you know, probably scrolling on their phones like most of us do every night. And they start to hear their baby crying. And so naturally Bud feels, hey, I should get up and go tend to my baby. You know, let my wife relax. She's been with the baby all day. You know, maybe I should go take care of it. But he ignored that feeling. And by doing so, he actually deceives himself and gets into the box. And once you're in the box, you start to see the world around you as justifying your behavior. So, for example, when he starts thinking about his wife, she definitely hears the baby just like he does. And it's her baby too. So she has just as much as a obligation to go care to the child as he does but he starts to see things as justifying his actions so he starts to think well i have work tomorrow i need to get a good rest i need to get a good night's sleep you know i'm the primary breadwinner i provide all the money you know she's been home all day maybe she hasn't been doing as much as i have i mean i've been at work and so he starts seeing his wife as as this lazy inconsiderate you know bad mother kind of a person and starts justifying his own behavior going well i have a lot to do tomorrow i'm a i'm a very important person you know i'm a vice president of a company i'm needed i need to be there in order to make decisions and she's just at home all day he starts seeing himself as hardworking, important, fair, and even a victim to some extent. And the idea is that when we're in the box towards other people, we really start to see the world and other people's actions as justifying for ourselves. It really emphasizes our own virtues and compares them to the faults and weaknesses of the people around us. In the example with his wife, he saw himself as the victim, justified in staying in bed. I've got a lot to do tomorrow. I'm a very important person at this company and she can care to the baby. She could take a nap tomorrow if she really wanted to. And so he starts seeing his wife as lazy, inconsiderate, unappreciative, insensitive, and so on and so on. Even though that really may not be the case. And perhaps his wife was deceiving herself as well, but that really isn't the point. We need to be able to see others as they really are, not for how we think they are. Which is a really important part of the box is getting out and seeing people as they really are, as other human beings who have also needs, wants, uh, important things to do tomorrow, and kind of honoring those feelings of trying to help one another. And so we get into the box. And so we're going to get into how we get out of the box in a minute, because a lot of the times we can already find ourselves in the box. The book goes over a reference where sometimes we're so deep in the box that we carry it with us all the time. And so it can be hard to get out of the box to actually see people as they really are. But I want to touch on another idea in regards to the box. By being in the box towards other people, we invite people to be in the box towards us. So kind of this counter hey, if I'm feeling this way and your behavior is justifying my actions, they're going to see the same thing. They're going to see your behavior as justifying their actions, which is maybe why they're not turning things in. Maybe why they might not be performing to the way you think they should be. And so it just kind of continues in this downward spiral. We continually see the faults of the other people and ultimately treat them as less than they really are. And this invites other people to start doing the same for us. They start to only see our faults. They see us as only demanding and whatnot. And so, for example, if we have an employee that frequently misses a deadline or comes in late or misses meetings, whatever have you, we may just start to see them as lazy, incompetent, inconsiderate, so on and so on, because they can't seem to do things on time. But then they start to see you as overly demanding, that you start to micromanage them a lot more. You start to kind of put more weight on them to kind of push them out. And so, there may be this lack of understanding and this just continues on and on until either you can only focus on what's constantly frustrating you. And 
to be honest, that's kind of how we want it to be. We want to continually find those justifications to why we're behaving in a certain way towards other people. So instead, we just condemn ourselves to mutual mistreatment. So another thing that the book touches on, and this is something that I'll have a picture here that kind of goes over, is some things that really don't work when we're in the box towards other people. So when we're not seeing them as people, but rather as objects. The first thing that they talk about that doesn't work is when we're frequently trying to change others. Usually when we're trying to change other, this is just this just reminds people of what's so frustrating about us. We can't control what other people do and we can't tr- control what other people choose to do. But we can try to guide and direct, but we can't make them be something that they're not or that they don't want to be. Like the saying goes, you can bring a horse to water but you can't make him drink. The second item on the list of things that don't work is trying to just cope with others. And this is something that I found myself in a lot of the time is I'm just trying to get through the day. I only have to get through this one meeting with them. It's only going to be a half hour. I'm just going to kind of put on my fake smile. We'll put on a fake laugh and then we'll go about our day just trying to survive, you know, just trying to go, okay, any interaction with them, I just need to get by. And so just trying to carry on and just ignore it in a way, just it just doesn't really work, especially when we go home and complain to our spouse or our family or friends or whoever it may be. Because once you start to complain and verbalize these frustrations, they become a lot more real. And like I said before, they start to justify your behavior that much more. Just jumping in here real quick to share a website I've used and will continue to use to improve myself and my career. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 20,000 classes to choose from. Whatever you're passionate about, you can find an amazing class on Skillshare to hone your practice. Skillshare has what you need. Learning is so critical for our lives and is a lifelong journey. Even when we finish school, we should keep on learning and keep working to improve ourselves. So you can try Skillshare absolutely free for one month. Go to Skillshare.com and sign up and use the code MYCAREERPATHFREE. That's all lowercase, no spaces to start your first month at no charge. And when you do decide to keep on taking those classes, use the code MYCAREERPATH30, that's MYCAREERPATH30, to get 30% off your first year on Skillshare. Keep learning and keep going. Now let's get back to the show. The third thing is just leaving. Simply leaving the workplace, getting away from them, because that doesn't help us get out of the box. Simply quitting and leaving the issue doesn't help you to get out of the box towards other people. It may be a temporary band-aid to the issue, but won't solve the whole problem. After the initial honeymoon phase of the new workplace, you'll probably find the same frustrations with maybe a different coworker or a different boss. Because we're not really changing anything, we're just hoping that a that the grass is greener somewhere else. The fourth thing that the Arbinger Institute argues that doesn't work while in the box is communicating, which is something that I thought was a little counterintuitive because in my mind, hey, we need to talk about the issues. We need to talk about what's being frustrated and hopefully that's what's going to work. However, in the book, if we go back to that example about Bud and his wife, they talk about, well, what if he started to communicate with her right then? Hey, why don't you go get up, get the baby? What is he probably going to end up saying? Is it going to be, hey, I think you should go take care of the baby. I just think you're better at it, anything like that. No, it's probably going to be, uh, I have a lot to do tomorrow. I'm kind of a big deal. I'm the vice president of a company. You've kind of been at home all day. You've been kind of lazy. So it's probably your turn to go get it. And ultimately what communicating would just do is that you're communicating the faults and weaknesses of the other people rather than actually focusing and solving the issue. And so instead of communicating about the problem and resolving it, ultimately both sides just kind of continue to express their frustration. The fifth thing is implementing new skills or techniques which kind of falls under a similar category of finding a new job. It simply adds a fresh cone of paint on the issue. And and the book, I really like this quote, as the book puts it this way, uh, new skills just provide people with a more sophisticated way to blame. And so finding ways that, hey, not only are they not, you know, performing to my expectations or my demands or whatever it may be, they're also doing it in a fancier way because now we have new skills, new ideas, new techniques that we can kind of implement. And the last point is changing our behavior. Which again, this is something that I kind of disagree with a little bit is because I think there's a lot we can do with ourselves because that's the only thing we can control really is how we act, how we behave and how we ultimately move forward and help the company grow and help those around us. So 
the idea that the book brings up is that we can't just be so heavily focused on ourselves in order to change what's going on around us because we have to be able to interact with people. We have to be able to talk to them on that kind of deeper level. Uh, and so the answer to getting out of the box is kind of questioning our virtue and seeing people as they really are. In the book, it kind of talks about Tom, who, again, is the one kind of going through this training and learning about these. After his first day of training, he goes home and he feels like he needs to do something for his wife and his kid. It doesn't get into too many of the details, but he spends the whole evening with them and it's just a great time. He wasn't so focused on himself going, I need to just focus on, you know, not seeing each other in the box. It was, I'm going to honor those feelings of what I can do for the people around us. And so he was able to see his wife and his son straightforwardly. And he was able to live in the moment and see others as they really are, which is something that in the workforce is incredibly difficult because a lot of the times we see people as objects. We see them as they have certain tasks that need to get done so that the company can move forward. And if they don't do the tasks, then obviously something is wrong. And so being able to see people as they really are and that way we can focus on those commitments and help other people succeed as well. Because ultimately in a career, we can't do it by ourselves. We have to work with other people. This is something that I've kind of have that I've had to kind of accept. Last year when I got the idea for the podcast, I wanted to do every episode by myself because I was the only one that I could really rely on. And after doing about three or four early episodes, and you can go back and listen to them, they're not the greatest. And so going back and going, okay, how can I collaborate more with others and how can I really, really learn from them has been so much more beneficial to me than just thinking, okay, I just need to tough it out. I just need to make it through this and then I can go it alone. So ultimately, my favorite takeaway from the book is removing our self-deception. We can actually discover practical and powerful solutions to the problems that we're sure are someone else's. Because a lot of the time in the workforce, when a problem arises, hopefully it's not our problem, you know, and we won't have to deal with it. Someone else may have made the mistake. Someone else may have done that and they should have to deal with it. Why would I need to deal with those solutions? Why would I need to deal with those problems? But being able to see things more clearly and see, hey, we're a team, we're a company. We need to move forward together and kind of get over our self-deception, get over the ways that people's faults and weaknesses are actually justifying our behavior. And that's what I kind of took away a lot of it because I remember going home endlessly going, hey, they're not doing this. And so therefore I didn't really do that. There were a lot of times when I thought if I just did this one thing, then we wouldn't have to deal with it here in a week or here in two days. And I would ignore that because obviously it's someone else's problem. So trying to change that and trying to see people as they really are and hopefully see ways that we can get outside the box. So ultimately, I highly, highly recommend this book to anyone who's having a hard time at work with frustrating coworkers, frustrating bosses, and just try to see things in a different way. Like I said, there's not a lot as far as, hey, focus on this one thing and everything will be fixed. But trying to see things and see people as they really are, I think could be a big help. So if you like this episode, make sure to leave a five-star review. Make sure to leave me an email, colton at mycareerpathpodcast.com or go to my website, mycareerpathpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you guys. I'd love to know what careers you guys are interested in. And I really want to get someone on the show to talk about it. If you have a particular person or career that you want to hear from, let me know. I'd be happy to reach out to them. 